So for people who don't know, Peter McAvenna. Peter McAvenna has taken time out of his day to come and join us. He's the uh, co-founder of Hearts of Oak. So if we can get this up, this is the organization here. You can go to W... w no, there's not WDO anymore. Uh, if you go to heartsofoak.org slash livestream, you'll get all the live streams Hearts of Oak does. And you'll be having, as you said, the godfather of the counter-jihad movement, David Horowitz, on tomorrow. Yes, so we do two live streams. We do Monday and Thursday, and then on Saturday night is a news review of the week. And had a interview with David Horowitz yesterday, which goes out today. Um, David Horowitz runs the David Horowitz Freedom Centre, Jihad Watch, Front Page Magazine, and his latest book is this, The Enemy Within, How a Totalitarian Movement is Destroying America. Fantastic read. He is a prolific book writer, but he has been called the godfather of the anti-Islam movement. Actually, it's the counter-Jihad movement, but he is a phenomenal individual. He's 82 and his work, he's come from a hard, far Marxist regime, probably from the 50s, 60s, 70s, he grew up a communist and then saw the light and came over to the right. So now opposes Marxism and fight for freedom and opposes the clash that we have with Islam and the freedoms in the West. So fantastic individual. And yeah, that's tonight on Hearts of Oak. Slash live stream slash live stream <laughs> or in any of the other platforms that we have so yes yeah so you came here today to talk about <clears throat> a petition you're setting up so yes we've had some success in these in the past remember we did uh we worked together with the uh petition to get the what was it the the it report was, published on grooming gangs yes it was the home office had uh, we're going to put together a report to look at the characteristics of grooming gang offenders and then they didn't do it, and then they said it wouldn't be public, and uh, we had a petition which was just after launch, so back March last year, and uh, there was a debate in the House, and it forced the government to release it. So actually, they can do something positive. Often you get a kind of copy and paste response, but it is possible to change government views and that report came out and exposed lots of feelings so it is possible but this latest one is entitled stop grooming gang members accessing public funds to fight their convictions and we'll go in the story but grooming gang members who have been charged convicted sentenced for raping children or other sexual offenses are currently able to access public funds to fight their convictions or any deportation efforts and we're calling the government to remove their access to public funds so they can no longer fight those convictions and certainly so they can't fight any effort to deport them if they're dual nationality, which some of these are uh, having Pakistani and British nationality. So um, I'd encourage the viewers to go and sign that, send it on, and we want to have a response from the government and a debate. I'm sure the government will say everyone should have access. I, I think if you rape children that you remove or lose some of your rights in society. If you're and a foreign national, especially. Absolutely, foreign national. And these people should have been on a plane immediately. Um, but this has gone on, these individuals, for nine years. Hmm. 2012, they went to jail. So um, it's gone on long enough. Um, but there's a huge issue with the government's failure and seemingly inability legally to actually do stuff. That's where we come in. And all this has happened under a conservative government. I, I really enjoy kicking Labour and pointing the finger at them. But this is the Tories. They've been in, in power for since 2010. It's, it's their fault that this is happening. It's on their watch and they could change the system so that these individuals are sent immediately. But it, the legal system just tangles it up, slows everything down, and in the meantime, these individuals get money. So if the one of the stories that, uh, if we move on, the headline is Rochdale Child Grooming, Anger is Gang Member Spotted in Town. This was April this year. This is a regular story that comes up every three, four months. Uh, and they look at different cases. This is the Rochdale Nine. Nine men convicted for conspiracy to rape or for raping uh, young girls and uh, they went to jail but they then got out and they've been free to walk around and probably every three four months a story comes up about them bumping into one of their victims in in the town yeah i remember one of it was where they bumped into asda yeah yeah and mps came out and said this is a disgrace we need to do something about it uh, and of course what happens absolutely zero i mean these men are not tagged there are no restrictions uh, i i don't know if they can actually look after children i don't know if they have their own kids i mean it's crazy the the freedom they have 
And are they changed? Well, I would argue that I don't know if they can change. If that's their lifestyle and that's what they enjoy or want, then actually can you prove and uh, that they've really changed and don't have those urges any longer. So this was one of the stories that I think Lord Pearson had read and we had discussed it in the office. And he said, I, I wonder do they have access to government money? I wonder do they have access to taxpayers' money to fight their convictions? So let's go to the, his, um, the parliamentary question, uh, Lord Pearson's parliamentary question, which he put down on the 19th of May, so just the next month after this story. And here he asked the government, how much money has been spent in legal aid for members of the Rochdale grooming gang, the nine of them? And what is their estimate of the amount of money spent assisting the victims of that gang? Now, probably our viewers will think the government will say lots of money have gone to the victims. Actually, why would the rapists get money? Well, here we have a breakdown, and I've never seen such a breakdown like this before. The nine of them got 1.85 million, just short of 2 million quid for nine. Now, there are a whole lot of questions. How many other grooming gang members, there are 420 sentenced and jailed, how many of those 420 have got public money? Is this into the hundreds of millions? Is it higher? So you get a breakdown. There's the second one. Adil Khan got 200,000 for a solicitor in the Crown Court. Uh, Abdul Raif got 207,000. These are large amounts of money. It's not just 10,000, 15,000. These are huge amounts of money, 1.85 million. And this just seemed to be brushed under the carpet. It was kind of picked up in one or two places, but not much. And actually, one of the other interesting parts of this is uh, the Lord Pearson asked about victims, survivors, how much the survivors of the Rochdale Grooming Gang have received. And if you scroll down on that, you find, yeah, we do not collect data on the cost of supporting individual victims. So like that's hell zero. you don't. That's zero. So they keep data on all the millions going to the rapists, but they claim to not have any data on the victims. So they're giving millions to the rapists. They're, they don't get this money in their pocket. It's for legal aid to fight the cases. Um, and the victims, actually, they don't get any money automatically. They don't get legal aid for the victims. So that's the current situation in the UK, the huge gulf between the taxpayers' money going to these individuals who rape children and the girls themselves getting seemingly zero because if the government were given specific money, they would say, now they talk about 151 million for victim support. Uh, that's, we're not asking for, we're asking specifically for the Rochdale grooming gang, how much money have the girls that have been part of that, how much have they got? And it seems as though it's zero. Mm. So that's where we are at the moment. If they knew what it was, they'd say. Because they would. They, they, well, if it was a high number, they'd say. Yeah. Because they'd be like, haha, look, we give loads of money to the girls. Yeah. We're not doing anything wrong. Yeah. I just can't get over how you spend 200 grand. Like, if we could scroll back up, some of those statistics, especially, if you, like the, the 200 grand for a solicitor and then 67 grand for a barrister in Crown Court. I don't know why he gets both. But also just the small ones there as well, like 200 quid in the police station for mm. advice. What the hell does that even mean? I don't know why I had to pay 200 quid to get some advice. But also, um, they're all different sums as well. Yeah. And the last two didn't get any advice. <laughs> <laughs> they are huge amounts of money, and the government doesn't seem to be embarrassed uh, at this. But this is and it's the legal system. It's the government taking taxpayers' money to put money in the legal system, which is all to do with making money. It's a racketeering system. It's not about justice. Um, if it was about justice, these men would be on a plane as soon as they were released from jail. It's about uh, putting money into the pockets of those in the legal system. And it's just a merry-go-round. So that's what it's about. Um, so the next story is what is happening to these men. So there are three of them, I believe, that had dual nationality. They were stripped off their uh, British citizenship and then they were going to be sent over to Pakistan because obviously they fit into Pakistan. And now they're using, so this is two of them, they're invoking Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, the human rights to family life. Again, no, no issue of the human rights of the girls who get raped. They don't get any 
financial help or any governmental help. But actually, these rapists, they need, they have a right to family life. Again, I think you lose some rights whenever you participate in such heinous crimes. But what an obvious lie as well, like the families can't just get on a plane to Pakistan and come see you. Well, the, yes, I, I remember looking through all the flights that went to Pakistan and the government claimed that they deport whenever it is safe and legal to do so. Uh, they'll argue because of COVID, it's maybe not safe to do it. Mm. They, hey, these men started getting out of prison in 2015. They could have started sending them immediately on a plane and yeah, we can drive them, we can hire a car, we'll drive them to Pakistan <laughs> and dump them there. Just get rid of them. Uh, so these individuals, they lost, they then took the government to court, and that's all the money involved, the two million. They took the government to court against their deportation in 2015, I think it was, 2016. They lost that in 2018. So that was 2018. But it took the government two years to issue deportation letters to them. So they lost. And it wasn't, as soon as they lost, the government immediately issued deportation papers. The government took two years to get round to sending them papers. And now they're using the uh, the Equality Act to fight that. Um, there's a there's a fantastic, uh, frightening line, horrendous line, um, near the near the bottom. I'll read it to you because I don't see it. Um, the line is that last month can told a preliminary hearing we have not committed that big a crime. So these men actually believe that it's not a big issue, we just rape some girls. Well, what's the problem? And it goes back to your issue about culture and possibly about religion, but that's a whole other discussion, um, that these people like this, how can you integrate them in society if they think that raping girls is normal. And I guess they're part of a culture that doesn't have any engagement with women. Women are hidden away and they don't have, um, they don't bump into women, they don't talk to women. Uh, so they will basically say, well, they couldn't control their urges because they don't understand how these things work. Yeah, I mean, there was one scumbag in one of these cases, not this one, but another one, where he tried to defend himself in court by saying he had a sexual emergency and that was his defense <laughs> for raping a child. So Just like, no, the, these people are unbelievably uncivilized. Yeah, yeah. Another part of this is that the short sentences, another issue that really hasn't come out a lot. So here, uh, one of them, Ralph, was jailed for six years. I think it was conspiracy to rip. Um, and he was jailed for six years. He was released in November 2014 after serving two years and six months. So he goes to jail for six years. He gets out after what? Good behavior? Because he doesn't rape anyone in jail? <laughs> is that what it is? He doesn't even serve half of a sentence and he's left out, seemingly with no restrictions. And he can live. Surely he should be told you need to live in a separate part of the country. You can't live anywhere near that you may see the victims. But he can go right back to the place of his crimes and. Where the victim lives and runs yeah, to them. Yeah. Why should the victim be forced to leave where they live? Uh, and yet they drop them back right in the middle. Um, and this story goes into what happened. And it's, uh, I've read enough of these stories. It is, is gruesome, is horrendous. And often you find communities, they close up and they don't want to give out these men. That they, they're not rushing to the police because they deal with these things internally, uh, which means that they don't. And often it's, it's the woman who is at fault because she's had sex with a man and it's her fault. It's not the man's fault. Never the man's fault. Never. There are two other areas of this. One is the next story. Child rape gang whistleblower. Child sex abuse is going on everywhere. This is from Breitbart. And this is uh, Maggie Oliver came out with this statement. This is uh, 29th of July, so just uh, weeks ago. And Maggie Oliver was the former detective constable in the Greater Manchester Police and thinks she left in 2012 uh, because she was horrified at this issue not being explored, not being opened and not being tackled. So she left the police and became a whistleblower and talked about this is what's happening in the Greater Manchester Police. Um, the two worst have been South Yorkshire Police and Greater Manchester Police for cover-ups. Um, and in this, she talks about a, well, she basically is, is on this story because there was a report out and the independent report from Bradford said that uh, the children had suffered abuse no child should have to experience. The, the local government were very sorry and they would do all they could to make sure it didn't happen again. This, 
This all was exposed in 2012 by Andrew Norfolk in the front of the Times. So this has been going on nine years. It was first exposed by Anne Cryer, a Labour MP up in Keighley, uh, 20 years ago. And she was called racist. She was called Islamophobic, everything for exposing this. And she said, I'm just pointing out what's happening. So it was a Labour MP that exposed it. Another Labour MP, Sarah Champion, does a lot of work on highlighting this. She lost her job mm. on the Labour front bench because she had an article in The Sun. Neither of them very popular with the Labour Party at total, though. No, no, not at all. No. So that is that. And then the the final part of this, I mean, there's so many parts of this and often it, you can get very angry at the individuals who've carried it out but for me actually can we do something good and can we one stop them getting money but can we help the girls who actually have been part of this so the the final story was from the metro and it was about victims not getting compensation now this is a little bit separate this is not legal aid this is a system that gives individuals compensation if they've been a victim of a crime. Uh, and there's a whole list of what money is available to certain crimes. And this headline, it's not right to deny victims compensation just because they have a criminal record. This was in July. It was an organisation called Unlock that looks after uh, victims of crime. And if you scroll down on this, let me touch on th this. It starts off just by talking about someone, James, who was stabbed in a terrorist attack. He went to get compensation through the system, which is the, compens the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority, which administers this compensation scheme. And he was told he couldn't get it because he had a criminal conviction. Now, the problem is, especially in grooming gangs, that these girls have been pulled into a life of petty crime. Yeah, because I, they're... I remember there was uh, an incident where a girl had been arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct after the police arrived and saw that basically she was being abused by a yeah. gang. They arrest the girl and yeah. not the gang members. Yeah. So I imagine she'd be one of the people that would then have a conviction. Well, exactly. And we've had fathers being arrested because they've gone to the police to complain about what's been happening. Uh, there is a horrendous part of this, which is the worst case they talk about was a woman who was repeatedly raped by two men when she was 13, being refused a payout because she had been prosecuted for driving without insurance and refusing to take a sample test. So the, her crime is quite small in relation to what's happening, but because of that small thing on her record, she doesn't get access to this compensation. And if we scroll up, there's a one in, in the middle of this. Uh, no, got... Yes, so there. So uh, their word is highlighted a little bit in orange. In fact, from 2016 to 2019, three and a half thousand casualties of violent crime, including 420 cases of rape and other sexual violence, were refused compensation due to their criminal record. And as you see, often these girls, they get plied with alcohol, with drugs, they get involved in petty crime. Uh, they're told they have to get involved in petty crime to pay for the alcohol and the drugs they've received. Um, and so they're on the, the police radar. And as you said, the police are very quick often to punish these girls instead of going after the men. So it's a very complicated issue and as Maggie Oliver said it is still happening up and down the country today it's not just past cases that are being prosecuted but it is still happening and we're hoping it, through this petition to try and cut off the avenue to access legal aid to these individuals um, and then separately we can look at how you actually channel money and compensation to the girls so they can mm. begin to rebuild their lives because they don't automatically get it. So it's a horrendous issue. The, the stories are awful. I've just read Jane Senior's book who ran a organisation called Risky Business that helped young girls who got caught up in this. Uh, and she has written a book about her experience in helping these girls and how they were failed by the police, how they were failed by social uh, secure, both social services, how they were failed by the council. Um, and often the, the parents would go to police and desperate and the police would say, these girls have chosen that lifestyle. They've chosen to be promiscuous. They've chosen to go out and Child sleep. prostitutes. Yeah. As if there is such a thing. Mm -hmm. No, there's a sex slave is yeah. what that is. Yeah. You cannot make a, a, a choice if you're underage. So it is the adult who is at fault. And yet they went after the children. So it's a massive area. And I would really encourage uh, the viewers to go and click on that 
uh, e-petition, put your name to it. And as we saw last year, it is possible to change government response, government opinion, government policy. And we're hoping to do the same on this. Yeah. I wonder, could we get um, uh, John or Vicky, if you could put it in the chat as well, because I'd like to, to set it up. But otherwise, thank you. Yeah. Depressing. Yeah, depressing. I, I mean, I don't like covering the grooming gangs, not because I'm, I'm sick of talking about it in the sense, but it just, it's depressing every single mm. time. But as you say, it still goes on. Yeah. Nothing's changed. Like, it didn't stop when they banned British Voldemort from mm. social media. Mm. Like, it wasn't just suddenly, and then there's no more rapists. Yeah. No. It just keeps going. If you enjoyed this segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can watch the full broadcast live every weekday at 1pm UK time on lotuseaters.com.